yesterday. We saw three different presentations. Two of them were dealing with Crook and the Crook's tube. J.J. Rutherford is coming up soon. So somebody want to just briefly explain to me what it was that we saw demonstrated yesterday through the videos? Okay, the blueberry. Okay, keep going with that. The it wasn't the blueberry. It was a blueberry muffin, muffin which was a representation, an American representation of something that the British know as the plum pudding model of the atom. And you'll be asked, you know, to describe the plum pudding model of the atom probably in a couple different 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 places, a couple different times. So, what is the plum pudding model, or if you want to think of it as the blueberry muffin model, sometimes called the chocolate chip model? but it'll be referred to as the plum pudding model. What is it trying to demonstrate? Right, okay, the stuff around it, right. So the, if you look, think of a muffin or pudding, it would be the fruit and then the bread. And when you think of pudding, this camp I'm tutoring yesterday, don't think of pudding as the soft, gooey, jello stuff. This is more like a cake. That's what a pudding is actually like, like a bread pudding, okay? So you've got pieces inside the dough, those little pieces being the blueberries. If we talk about a muffin inside the, the blueberries inside the, the muffin to make it a blueberry muffin, or pieces of plum inside of the plum pudding, that those pieces represent electrons. Remember, prior to this, Dalton's theory said that atoms were one piece, like a billiard ball. It's just one piece of stuff, and that they were indivisible. We said at a certain point that's true, at a certain point that's also false. Okay? That the cathode ray tube and cathodes, which form the rays, which we later now, he called corpuscles, we call electrons, that electrons are a piece that's at least one to 2,000 times smaller than an atom, and that it must have come from atoms, therefore an atom is divisible. There's something that makes up an atom that can be removed from the atom, and that's what we call the electron. And so what they tried to represent was this newly discovered divisibility of the atom. That an atom is not just a solid chunk of stuff, but that an atom actually has, is made up of different pieces. Recognizing that the corpuscles, the cathodes, later called electrons, had a charge that was a negative charge, but realizing that the atom was neutral. And if the atom is neutral and has pieces inside of it that are negative, there must be balancing charges inside of it that are positive. So how do we understand that? Well, the only particle they knew was the electron and the whole atom, whatever it was. So the first branch of trying to model that was, we have a muffin, which we would call positively charged, and inside of that, there were electrons which were negatively charged. And those positive and negatives balanced each other out so that the overall charge of the muffin was net neutral. Now that, remember I led yesterday with a few of these thoughts. Everything has charges. The only issue becomes, does it have a net charge? You have charges on you. Everything has charges on it. But if the number of negative charges equals the number of positive charges, then the net charge is zero. So, an atom that's neutral has a net charge of zero, and if it has positive pieces in it, it must have some counterbalancing positive to counterbalance the negative that's in it. And that's where the plum pudding model came from. So the Crookes tube, the CRT tube, was the first real movement forward in figuring out that the indivisible atom actually was divisible, but it's only divisible we'll say divisible to a point. We're still gonna hold that an atom is the smallest consistent piece of matter, but that it itself is also made up of pieces. And the pieces that we know, that we're gonna talk about here in chemistry of electrons, protons, and neutrons, that they're actually smaller pieces than those. There are other pieces besides those three pieces, but they're beyond the scope of, of this class here. You know, theorists get into some of those smaller pieces are actually made up of pieces combined. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves too much. We're going to go back into the book and pick up at about page 89, talking about electrical charge and atomic structure. Some of this is going to be real practical. We're going to, we're going to move forward and talk about protons and neutrons even before we show the gold foil experiment on how Rutherford discovered the presence of positive pieces. 
And so the next step after the Plum Pudding model is going to go to the Bohr model, this heliocentric model, basically saying, hey, it's not that there are negative pieces that we call electrons and the rest of it is this positive kind of goo, but actually that there are positive pieces as well. And then if there's more pieces that are not positive or negative, there must be pieces that are neutral. The three different components of the atom. When Thompson was doing his experiment with the cathode rays, he figured out, and we heard two different numbers yesterday, that the mass was one one thousandth to one uh, to two thousandth of the size of an atom. He compared it to the hydrogen atom, the smallest atom, and he said, the piece I have here is so much smaller. And he also figured out that when he used different metals and different gases, that the mass and the ratio of the charge to that small particle was exactly the same no matter what gases or elements were used. And so he said, you know, there's a consistency here. It's not that these cathodes that come off of lithium or whatever metals he used, I'm not going to go through a long list, but whatever he used, that he had p particles coming off that were the exactly, exactly the same in those characteristics that he was measuring, exactly the same regardless of the metal or the gas. And so he said there must be a fundamental building block to every atom which is identical, regardless of what the element is. And that's why we talk about the elements being made up of a certain number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. But the electrons, the things we call electrons, are actually exchangeable. Frankly, so are protons and neutrons. We're going to get to the place where there are, if we think of our Duplo analogy, there are red, blue, and yellow Duplos that make up every atom. It's just how many of them do you have? And how many of them you have determines what element is you have. So these are the fundamental building blocks of each atom are the same, but those same blocks combine to build unique elements, unique atom and atoms of each element. And then each unique element combines with other elements to form compounds. And everything that we know is formed of elements, and this either as compounds or as mixtures or as pure elements. So this common thing to all atoms he called electrons. Later, Rutherford discovered the protons, and Chadwick discovered the neutrons these three basic components. Now something real practical. We're going to spend a little bit of time looking at the periodic table of elements. First thing I want you to recognize is that in each one of these cells, and if you want to turn in your book as well, it might be more helpful because this periodic table, either on your front cover for some books or for others, I, it's on one of the pages. You've already recognized it in your book as your periodic table. So as you're reading through the, the, the text, refer back to this periodic table from your book because the numbers are sometimes in different arrangements. If you look at this table, you'll see there's a smaller number on the top of each cell and a larger number on the bottom of each cell. That's reverse here on the table up here. The smaller number is on the bottom and the larger number is on the top. Now real quickly, you're going to figure out which one is which because one number is always going to be larger than the other one once we identify it. So the trick is to look at the periodic table you're using, see two numbers, know what the smaller number is and what the larger number is. The smaller here is on the bottom, the smaller in your book is on the top. So what is that smaller number of the two we're looking at? For example, sodium over here, there's several pieces of information on the large chart in the front of the class. It has a, represents this with a lower number here of 11, and on top it's 22.98977. What is it, how is it represented in your textbook? Well, sodium has an 11 on top and a 23.0 on the bottom. So these are the two different ways from just what you have in your textbook and what you have in front of the classroom that the same information is represented on both of these charts. What can you tell me about the difference between these two numbers? For example, these two numbers, 22.98977 and 23.0. This is... This is, so rounded to the nearest tenth, can you say that in some chemistry terms that we have? Just a second. Give Ray a chance and then Ike's going to steal it from you. Three. Two. Go ahead, Ike. That's right. So this one is much more precise, right? This one is precise. We're saying this is out to the tenths place. This is tenths, hundreds, thousands, ten thousandths out to the hundred thousandths place. So it's much more precise. So the instruments that they used over here, 
Okay. The other part of it is for your textbook, they're, they're giving you a rounded number, an easier number to work with, frankly, what it is. And we'll, in a moment, we'll explain what those numbers are and why they're different and why they're not whole numbers as well. This one happens to be a whole number, 23.0. But it, it happens to be a whole number. In actuality, it's not a whole number. It's 22.98977, and it actually pr probably goes out many more places than that. But they choose to round it to make it just that precise. So, starting on page 90, determining the number of protons and electrons, first thing to talk about is the atomic number. And of those two pieces of information, whether in your book or on the chart, the smaller one that you see is the atomic number. In this case, for sodium, the atomic number is 11. Atomic number of 11. You'll notice on the periodic table, too, that the numbers go in sequence. You're not surprised. You've seen this already. One, two, come back to this side. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and it just counts from left to right, from top to bottom on the periodic table, except in these cases here where 57 and 89 come down to this lanthanoid series down here, and then they pop back up on the top here. So they're virtually all done sequentially, left to right, top to bottom, on the periodic table. In increments of one. So what does that atomic number represent? It's true, but primarily the first thing I think of is the number of protons. Think in terms of protons. This element of sodium is sodium because it has 11 protons. Okay? It doesn't have to have 11 electrons to still be sodium, but it has to have 11 protons. Protons is the key component of an element to determine what that element is. If you look at an atom, and you could see the number of protons, it's the number of protons that are going to determine what that atom is, what element that atom represents. So. It says right here that the atom's atomic number tells how many protons it contains. The next line in your book on page 90, the second blue line, says that all atoms have an equal number of electrons and protons. And I want to qualify that for you. All neutral atoms have an equal number of electrons and protons. It's an equal number. We're going to find out real quickly that we can have an atom of sodium that doesn't have 11 electrons. Okay? But if it doesn't have 11 electrons, it's going to have a net charge. So if it has a net charge, it's, called, it's referred to as an ion. Okay? So every element, you can create ions of every element. And I could have a sodium atom that doesn't have 11 electrons. It would still be sodium, it just would not have 11 electrons. If it had 10 electrons, it would be a positive 1 charge. If it had 12 electrons, it would be a negative 1 charge. But it would still be sodium. But when I say that the neutral atom has 11 protons and also must have then 11 electrons, it must have 11 in order to have a net zero charge. Okay, and that's where we're going to start with on all of our chemistry is what does it have when it's a net zero charge? And then what it actually has as an ion is going to dictate how it reacts chemically and things like that. Okay, so we're going to start with, okay, the atomic number is 11. 11 means it has 11 protons and the neutral atom has 11 electrons as well. Works for every single element. So potassium has an atomic number of 19. You know immediately that potassium ha must have 19 protons. If an atom does not have 19 protons, it is not potassium. And in order for it to not be an ion, in order for it to be a neutral atom, it has to have an equal number of electrons. So a neutral atom of potassium has 19 protons and must have 19 electrons. Again, if it has less or more than 19 protons, it's not potassium. If it has more or less than 19 electrons, it's still potassium, but it's an ion of potassium. Okay, see the difference? Okay. Third piece of information. So we have protons, electrons, and then neutrons. For sodium, we said that there were... 11 protons, and for it to be a neutral atom, it would have 11 electrons. Now, we get into the wild card component, and that is the number of neutrons. Neutrons is that subatomic particle that makes up an atom that has no net charge. It's a net neutral. 
And we can figure out the number of those pieces, the number of neutrons that are in any given atom, if we know the atomic number. And we also know this other piece of information. Here it's 23.0, over here it's 22.98977. And this piece is referred to as the atomic mass. So you've got the atomic number and the atomic mass. You may hear it referred to as the atomic weight. That's what it was referred to quite often when I was younger. But it's technically the atomic mass. In your mind, if, someone, if I slip up and say the atomic weight, I'm referring to the atomic mass. That'll be a slip on my part. So I'll try to be consistent. So atomic weight, atomic mass. We know now, we're, we're savvy enough to know that mass and weight are not the same thing, right? That the mass is a measure of the amount of stuff that weight is the force created by gravity that pulls on that stuff. So what we'd say is the atomic mass of hydrogen is the same on Earth as it is in the moon, but the atomic weight would be different because the gravity is different on the moon. So to keep it consistent, it should be atomic mass. So how do we figure out the number of neutrons? Well, the, the most simplistic way of understanding this is that the number of neutrons is equal to the atomic mass minus the number of protons. The atomic mass minus the atomic number gives you the number of neutrons. So in this case here, we have 23 as our atomic mass. We have 11 protons. Our atomic number is 11. And so what is our number of neutrons? 12. In this, right here, there are 12 neutrons. Twelve plus eleven. Remember, not the electrons. Neutrons and protons. Twelve plus eleven is twenty-three. Now I use sodium because it's a whole number. But look over on the way it's depicted on the large table with these numbers here. We see that the numbers are in different positions, but hopefully now we can say, hey, you know what? The atomic mass is always going to be greater than the atomic number. So if I'm confused, the atomic number is always the smaller, the atomic mass is always the greater. Another way to remember is that the atomic number is always a whole integer. One, two, three, four, so on. It's always a whole integer. The atomic mass is quite frequently a decimal number. It's a fractional number, it's a part of. So in this one over here, you see that it's a little bit less than 23, which means the number here is actually gonna be a little bit less than 12. If we do the math in the same way, this element over here, the way it's depicted here, would indicate that there's actually 11.989977 neutrons. So you got to wait for a minute and go, well, how can you have 11.989977 of an indivisible component of a neutron? And I think I alluded to this yesterday, but that the atomic mass is not a consistent integer because different atoms of every element can have different numbers of neutrons. Okay, let me say that again. Atoms of an element, the same element, can have different numbers of neutrons. And when it has, when we look at atoms and consider their neutrons, the differences between them, they're referred to as isotopes isotopes of, in this case, sodium. I would have an isotope of sodium. I might have an isotope of sodium that has the 12 neutrons. I might have another isotope of sodium that has 13 neutrons, and another isotope that has 14 neutrons. They're still sodium because they have the same number of protons. They have 11 protons, so they are sodium. They may or may not have 11 electrons, and if they don't, then they're an ion of sodium, but if they have varying numbers of neutrons, they're referred to as isotopes of sodium. And basically what that means is they've got an extra neutral particle, and if you've got an extra neutral particle, you have more mass. But other than that, for our purposes, they're chemically exactly the same with each other, all the way down. So we're gonna look at how to compute that. You'll see, let me go through the, my notes in the book here real quickly the bottom of page 90, isotopes, they're atoms with the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons. Okay. We'll actually use carbon-12 as an example because it's listed in your book on the next page as a good example 
And it is a good example because when we get into these units of mass later on, we're going to refer back to carbon, carbon 12. So it's good to understand what that means when we say carbon 12 versus carbon 13 versus carbon 14. So isotopes are a little bit heavier. And actually, if we look at the top of 91, they're, they're going to walk through this. The three types of carbon, carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. Now, there's two different ways that I can designate an isotope. One of them is using the chemical symbol and then using a preceding superscript. You know, we, we wrote before, we're doing a chemical formula. If I had C5H10, I knew that there were five carbons and 10 hydrogens, okay? Now for isotopes, we use just the elemental symbol and we use a preceding superscript as opposed to a reseeding subscript. What this tells me is not that I have 14 carbons, but that I have one atom of carbon and it is a carbon 14 atom. This could be written in plain language as carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. Let's go ahead and write what the table would look like, what the periodic table of elements would have for each one of these. What would be the information around that? Well, every one of them would be carbon. So I'm going to write them in sequence like this. Let's do it like the book does that puts the atomic number on top and the mass below. So what must the atomic number of carbon-12 be? Carbon-12. If it has a mass of 12, look over at your table. What is the atomic number for carbon? Six. Good. Carbon has an atomic number of six. What does that information tell me? Now stick with the atomic number. What does the atomic number tell me? Carbon always has six protons, and the neutral atom has six electrons, right? Now, depicting that here, we're going to write the, the atomic number on top, again, using the way the book does it. The atomic number on top. Every one of those carbons, if it's carbon-12, carbon-13, or carbon-14, it has to be a carbon with six protons. Why? Because if it doesn't have six protons, it's not carbon. Carbon has to have six. If it only has five, then it's boron. If it has seven, it's nitrogen. It's carbon because it has six. All right, so every one of these, carbon-12, 13, 14, would have an atomic number of six. But what must the atomic mass be, the atomic mass is going to be the number that after the hyphen. So carbon-12 would look like this, carbon-13 and carbon-14. Now from these two pieces of information, we can tell how many neutrons are in each one of those atoms, right? In this case, the number of neutrons is the atomic mass minus the atomic number. So 12 minus 6 means, over here, the number of neutrons. We'll have a column for the number of neutrons. How many neutrons? 6, 7, and 8. So think of it this way. Carbon-12 has 6 protons, 6 neutrons, and in its neutral state has 6 electrons. If I take that same atom and I give it another neutron, I've now made carbon-13. And if I take that carbon-13 and I give it one more neutron, I now have carbon-14. Okay? So all I've done is added a neutron. Chemically, it's, these are going to react the same for our purposes here. They're going to react the same. All they have is more mass. But other than the more mass, they still have the same number of protons. They still have the same number of electrons. The electrons are still going to be in their same configurations for all of them. So for reaction purposes, they appear and they act the same. They just happen to have different masses. Now, one of the things they clear up in the book, I think they do a good job that we need to remember, is that there is no baseline. Remember I said for the electrons, kind of like the baseline atom is the neutral atom where it's got the same number of electrons as it has protons. So it would have six electrons. That's kind of the base. And anything's not the base is an ion. If it has one less or two less or one more or two more electrons, it's an ion. 
this phrase for isotopes, a lot of people tend to think, okay, carbon-12 is the base, and carbon-13 and carbon-14 are isotopes. But in actuality, all three of these are isotopes. Every atom is, could be referred to as an isotope. What the word isotope means, and in, in the book, they, they, I th again, I think they say this well, is that the word isotope sets up a relationship between them. It's kind of like saying brothers, okay? Let's pretend, I know you guys kind of act that way anyway, but say you guys are a group of brothers, right? Okay? Which one is the base brother, and which ones are the odd men out? It's kind of the question then. Oh, wait a minute. I mean, you might actually have an answer for that, but when it comes to the atoms, it's not like that. It's like, hey, we're brothers, which means I'm an isotope of him, and he's an isotope of me, and we're an isotope of him. You know, we're in relationship to one another. So it's not that carbon-12 is the right stuff, and carbon-13 and carbon-14 are isotopes. It's that carbon-12 is one of the isotopes. Carbon-13 is one of the isotopes. Carbon-14 is one of the isotopes. There's no such thing as an atom that is not, could not be referred to as an isotope. Because when you bring the isotopes together, say I have a sample of carbon-13, what I'm saying is I have a sample where every one of them is the same isotope, but it's not wrong. It's just how often does it occur? Matter of fact, in the text, they tell us that for carbon, the way these occur in nature, for carbon-12 occurs 98.9% .9 of the time. Carbon-13 is 1.1% of the time. And carbon-14 is 1.0 times 10 to the negative 12th percent of the time. Okay. So what's this telling me? If I have a handful of carbon, you know, went out and just took some charcoal and ground it all up and say, there I go. I got a handful of carbon in my hand. And if I were to go through and separate all of these little atoms of carbon out, put them in different piles. Oh, this one here, I can see it has six neutrons in it. I'm going to put it in this pile. And this one has seven neutrons. I'm going to put it in that pile. When I was all done, 98.9% .9 of all of the carbon in my hand would have had six neutrons and would have been considered to be carbon-12. The vast majority, 98.9% .9 of the time. 1.1% of the time, I would find an atom that had an extra, what would be considered maybe an extra neutron, okay? It's not really extra, it's just different, you know? He's not weird, he's my brother, right? Okay, it's just a little different. 13 has seven neutrons, and we would put that in the pile for carbon 13, and that would happen 1.1% of the time. And this very, very, very small number, 1.0 times 10 to the negative 12. Remember to write that in decimal form, we've got to move this decimal plate 12 places to the left. It's an incredibly small number. But it exists of carbon-14, meaning I found carbon that has eight neutrons in it. So if I had 1,000 atoms of carbon, 989 of them are going to be carbon-12. And that's where we get this idea of that's the standard is because it happens so frequently. Most of the time, the number of neutrons, there's one isotope, which is the dominant isotope. For carbon, it's carbon-12. If I've got 1,000 atoms, 989 of them are going to be carbon-12s, which means it's virtually all carbon-12, right, in my thinking. Out of that 1,000 atoms, only 11 of them are going to be carbon-13. And out of that 1,000, I'm not probably even going to have one carbon-14. Okay. Now, here's the deal. The reason why the atomic mass is not a whole number, over here, for example, with carbon, carbon up here is really, really close to being a whole number, but it's 12.0111. So on the chart, carbon over there, I'll, I'll write it the um, book way, would be carbon 12, 12.0111. If I look at that number, do you see how that number, if I look at that number and I recognize that this is a, an average, it's called a weighted average. 
can you see now, by the way we figure this out, the fact that it's not perfectly 12, but even if it were perfectly 12, I would still know that there are variances, right? There are isotopes. But on average, when I reach into that big bucket and pull one out, on average, it's going to have 12.0111 as its atomic mass, meaning it's going to have, oh, excuse me, I wrote this with a 12. It should be 6, right? They're all 6s. So it should have, you could say, well, that means you have 6.0111 neutrons on average. But no, no one of those atoms is going to have 6.0111. They're going to have six, and a couple of them are going to have seven, and rarely, rarely, but occasionally, you'll have eight. So on average, you have 12.0111 as your mass, or 6.0111 neutrons. So you see that this is an average number, which means it probably never really happens. You never really have, you, you cannot have a part of a neutron. But mathematically, it works out percentage-wise to be this on average. In fact, I think later on, we use this, this number to do the weighted average to figure this out. So like if you took 98.9 times 6 plus 1.1 times 7 plus 1.0 times 10 to the neg negative 12 times 8, you added those together and divided them out, you'd find out that the average is 12.0111. But again, it's written either in this form, carbon-14, or written out, carbon-14, meaning that it has six protons because it's carbon, 14 because we're told that was the isotope we're dealing with, and the difference between those two are eight, which is how many neutrons we have. And that occurs incredibly rarely, but it does occur. Part of the reason for the rarity of it is, I mean, you've heard this phrase before, right? Carbon-14? Have you heard that in science before? Okay. What is carbon-14 related to? Where have you heard that term used regarding? Dating? Dating things. That's what I was getting at. Sorry, they're a couple at the same time. But dating things. Science will say, well, well, let's figure out how old it is. We put, we carbon-14 dated it. We tested it for, with carbon-14 dating and determined it to be a certain number of years old. The reason why they check for carbon-14 dating is this isotope decays. It decays into carbon-13 and carbon-12. And it decays at a, a, a measurable rate over time. And so the re relationship or the ratios of carbon-14 to other carbons gives us a way of checking to find out what, how long it's been around because the longer it's been around, the more it's decayed. It has a half-life. So the amount of carbon-14 gets cut in half for every certain number of years, it gets cut in half. The carbon-14, I think, is useful, but we need to be careful with carbon-14 because it's based upon the presumption. You always worry about presumptions, right? Well, I presume this is going to happen, therefore... Carbon-14 dating is based upon the presumption that the percentage of carbon in these isotopes has been constant throughout the history of the Earth. Now, if that's true, then the carbon dating method has a lot more credibility. But many people that question carbon-14 dating question the presumption it's based upon that these percentages have always been constant. Okay? That's one of the underwriting problems with that dating system. And then on page 92, they spend a little bit more time clearing this up. So this would be one of those moments where I'm stomping my foot. Remember, there is no such thing as a non-isotope. When we call something an isotope, we're just recognizing the fact that it has a unique number of neutrons, not that it has the wrong number of neutrons. There is no right or wrong when it comes to the number of neutrons that an element can have. It's just how often does it, do they actually occur. Take a few minutes looking at the examples then. Any questions on this before I erase the board? Just what you have now. You may not completely understand it, but over time, this will soak in. It's not that difficult, but it might be new. So it's going to take a little bit of time. But any questions that you know you have right now regarding atomic number, what that means, 
atomic mass, what that represents, and how it's computed. Not necessarily be able to compute it now, but just the idea that it's an average. Okay? And then how we figure out the number of neutrons by subtracting the atomic number from the atomic mass. No? These basic pieces of information are going to be incredibly important throughout the course. And you can find every piece that we've talked about. It's consistent for every single element. So the fact that you can figure it out with carbon means you can do it for every element that's on the periodic table. F figure out by looking at the number how many protons it has. Figure out how many electrons it has in the neutral element. Look at its atomic mass. And using the number and mass, figure out how many neutrons it has on average by using that number. You may be given that you have a sample of carbon-13. You should be able to very quickly figure out that, oh, that carbon has seven neutrons. What are the name and symbol of an atom that is made up of 10 protons? Now, there's nothing standard about this. It's just my notation. So what I'm showing you here is when I look at the word problem, how do I write it on my paper? Okay, the name and symbol of an atom that is made up of 10 protons. So I, wrote, I write 10 protons. 10 electrons and 11 neutrons. Okay? 10 protons, 10 electrons, and 11 neutrons. So what's my first step? I'm supposed to write the, the name and symbol of this atom. Where do I go first? Okay, let's start with the most basic component of a hunt. The number of protons. What is a way that we've just learned is a way to describe the number of protons? It's called the atomic the atomic number. This this atom, whatever it is, has an atomic number of ten. Right? It's got ten protons. It has an atomic number of ten. Let's go over to the chart and we'll hunt for ten. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. Atomic number ten. It's neon. I know it's neon. I'm going to go ahead and be so bold as to say neon with a symbol of NE. How do I know that I know that I know that I know that this is neon? It has ten protons. If it doesn't have ten protons, it's something else. It is whatever the number of protons says it is. This has to be neon. Why? It has 10 protons. Pr neon's the only thing that has 10 protons. And anything that has 10 protons is neon. Okay? That's the first part. That's done. Second part we can consider now. Okay, it has 10 electrons. What does that tell me about this particular atom of neon? It's a neutral. Good. It's a neutral atom. It has exactly the same number of electrons as it has protons. So it has a net charge of zero. It's a neutral atom. Good. And let me put the symbols here like the book. We said it has an atomic number of 10, right? What other piece of information do I need to write? Good, right? Atomic mass. So we've got atomic number. We need to figure out the atomic mass. How do I figure out the atomic mass? We would find the number of neutrons by subtracting the atomic number from the atomic mass, but we're trying to figure out what the atomic mass is now. So thinking about it the other way, the atomic mass is the sum of, go ahead. That's right. Sorry, Mr. Parker. Let me fix that. There you go. Right. The atomic mass is going to be the sum of protons and neutrons. Add these two numbers together. So 10 and 11, 21. Okay. So if I have an atom that has 10 protons, 10 electrons, and 11 neutrons, I have an atom of neon because it has 10. But I more correctly have an atom of neon 21. I could write that as neon 21. I could also write it as 21 neon. These all communicate the same information. If I told you 
I'm looking at an atom of neon 21, you would say, oh, neon 21, okay, it has, it's neon. I know it's symbol because it's on the chart I had to memorize. It has 10 protons because neon has 10 protons. It's neutral, therefore it has 10 electrons because this has to have the same number of electrons and protons. And what do we say? 21. On average, it has 20.179. But for that particular one atom I'm looking at, it has to have a whole number. Because for any one particular atom, I can't have part of, an, of a neutron. So I have one atom of neon 21. On average, is this the typical? No. How far off are we? The typical number here for neon is 20.179. So if you had to guess, does the average atom of neon have 11 neutrons or 10 neutrons? 10, right. Because if we only had two choices, 10 or 11, and if they were exactly the same, what would the atomic mass average be? Well, if we had 10 or 11, the atomic numbers would be either 20 or 21. And if they were exact number of each, it would be right down the middle, right? Which would mean we'd have atomic mass of 20.5. The fact that this number here is much closer to 20 than it is to 21 tells me on average, between those two choices, the average atom of neon is only going to have 10 neutrons on average. As a matter of fact, 18 out of every 100 is going to have 11, if those are my only two choices. But that's not the way it works. There's more than those two choices. Okay? So it is neon 21. Neon 21, here's the way it would appear on a chart. Neon 21, neon hyphen 21 is the way that you could write it out. And you can also designate it with neon with a superscript preceding of 21. Second part of that example. How many protons, electrons, and neutrons make up an iodine-129 atom? Let me write it in a... Iodine-129. Okay. How are we going to attack this problem? Iodine 129. What do you what do you what can you find from the periodic table extremely quickly? 53. I I love 53s. Man, I miss flying CH 53s. There was a helicopter I flew in the Marine Corps. But that's not what you meant, was it? Oh, the atomic number is 53. Okay, because over here on iodine, right, atomic number is 53, which tells me that no matter what atom of I'm looking at, if it has 53 protons, it's iodine. It doesn't mean it has to have 53 electrons, but it will if it's neutral. But it has to have 53 protons. So in my chart here, my protons, I have to have 53, okay? If I write it another way, it would have to be 53. It has to have 53 protons. If it's neutral, then, we know also how many electrons it has, right? Because it has to have 53 for it to be neutral. If it doesn't have 53, it's still iodine. It's just not a neutral. It's now an ion of iodine. And the last piece of information is the number of neutrons. We figure out the number of neutrons mathematically by doing what? I think you got it right, but between you, I couldn't hear either of you. So what I think you said, was correct, take the mass, subtract the number of protons, right? The atomic number. So we have 129, and we have 53 protons. So the difference is going to be the number of neutrons of 76. Seventy-six neutrons. Now, 129 was my atomic mass, so here it would look like this. Iodine, 129. Could also be written as iodine, 129, 
and we already have it here as iodine-129. So 53 protons, 53 electrons, and 76 neutrons to make up iodine-129. The reason why it's iodine-129, if it were iodine-128, it would have 75 neutrons. If it's iodine-130, it would have 77 neutrons. But it's still iodine because we haven't changed the number of protons. It's still iodine because the number of electrons doesn't matter. The name comes from the number of protons. But it's 129 because of the number of neutrons that make it up. We have a couple minutes on your own. 3, 2. Give the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons that make up, let's do B, fluorine 19. Do just an on your own together. Do one more. Fluorine 19. I'm going to write it that way. Fluorine 19. The number of protons, electrons, and neutrons. Okay. How many protons does fluorine 19 have? Has nine because it has to have nine in order to be fluorine. Number of electrons? It's neutral, it's going to have nine as well. Number of neutrons? Ten because it's 19 minus nine is ten. Three three says an atom has 33 protons. Stop. What is it? It has 33 protons. It's all, that's the only far that, that's as far as we need to read. An atom has 33 protons. 33 astatine. Okay. So it's AS. If it has 33, it has to be astatine. 33 electrons, all that tells us is it's neutral. That'll become much more important later on. For right now, it just means it's neutral. And it has 41 neutrons. If it has 41 neutrons, what's its atomic number? Or excuse me, atomic mass. If it has 41 neutrons. <laughs> Piece of work. <laughs> what, it's, uh, well, so did I. <laughs> if it has 41 neutrons, what must its atomic mass be? It's 41 plus 33. 74. Acetane 74. 